Well, hey, y'all. Good morning. I am so excited to be here. Um, it's such a privilege to be a part of NDC and to be in, in London. And I'm so excited that all of you have made the decision to join me for this hour of LOLs and whatnot. <laughs> and um, in my previous company, we had this thing about punching bears. We would, um, it was about doing hard things and about being scrappy and uh, being resourceful and, and uh, taking on bigger things than we, we thought we were capable of. And it was part of our mantra, get out there and punch some bears today. Well, in reality, punching bears is probably not such a great idea. Uh, does it only provoke the bear to maul you worse? Um, and this has nothing to do with the talk I'm about to give. I just thought you'd like some free advice. <laughs> now, some of you, like me, are excited to be here. You've been soaking up some content already. You're, you're learning all some new things. Uh, you can't wait to go back to your workplace next week and unleash all your new knowledge upon your unsuspecting co-workers. But maybe some of you are like me a lot of times at conferences like this where I start feeling a little anxious about all this new technology and how am I going to learn all this new stuff and how am I going to convince my boss to allow me to use any of this new technology. And, you know, I'm here to throw some more stuff at you, right? Well, so we could talk about where we see technology going in the next five years, but that'd be about as accurate as the weather forecast. Uh, we could talk about IoT, that's a really hot topic. Um, how you could, I could try to convince you that you should be connecting everything in your homes to some type of Raspberry Pi or, or something and, and gaining all that, that good information and data and automating systems. Or we, we could talk about the latest JavaScript framework um, that's, that's, you know, created only yesterday. You should throw away everything you've, you thought you knew about JavaScript and start with this new thing. Um, or what if I told you that regardless of the technology you know, regardless of the role that you have, regardless of your title, um, that you have amazing potential to impact your workplace and your family and your community and beyond in powerful and meaningful ways. First, let me indulge my, in, in a story about myself, a cautionary tale, if you will. When I got started in my career, I was doing a mixture of IT and, and programming. I absolutely loved you know, getting hands on with hardware and, and solving hard problems and fixing things. And I couldn't believe that I actually got paid to do these things, right? Yes. But then a funny thing happened. I was promoted to a management position and I hated it. All I wanted was to write code. I, I, I'm, I'm an introvert and expecting me to go and visit people in their offices or in their cubicles and ask them about how their work is going and, you know, manage other people and, and things. It was just not remotely in my nature. I resented that role and the responsibilities and I did the bare minimum to get by. And within 18 months, I took a straight programming job making less money. And the cycle of promotion to management and despair and then changing jobs repeated itself several times in my career. And my wife would ask me, what do you have against making more money? <laughs> well, my ideal job consisted of give me the most powerful computer, give me a virtually unlimited supply of caffeinated beverages, and stand back while I sling some code. Can I get an amen? You know what I'm talking about, right? And it wasn't until many years later that through some, maybe some mentoring and some training and not to mention 
maybe a little bit of maturity, I began to realize that my attitude towards everything outside of just slinging code and writing code needed an attitude adjustment. I've had to come to terms with being a leader, and I want to give you some things that I've learned along the way. Now, many of you may be thinking the same thing that I was thinking, that leadership is for management, and for the longest time, I didn't want to have anything to do with being in management. But leadership is not just for management. Not to say that there aren't some aspects of leadership that are part of being in a management role. If you're in a management role, of course, you need to have leadership skills. And there's, there's aspects of being a leader that, that require, uh, you know, for you to set the culture for your team and so forth. But I'm here to say that leadership is for all y'all. Now, I'm from the South in the U.S., and we have some vocabulary, right? Um, there's you, singular. There's y'all, which means, you know, three, four people. And then when you mean everybody, it's all y'all. So a little, little lesson in, in redneck English. So there are qualities and skills of being a leader that we all need to learn. Uh, a few years ago, I was part of a company where they sent us to a one-year leadership program uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. And our group was called the Emerging Leaders. But every time I saw Emerging Leaders, I thought the word emerging looked kind of like Irma Gerd. So that's what I secretly called our little group. And then every six weeks, we would get together uh, for a day off-site and at this training facility, and we'd learn some core leadership skill. We learned things like team dynamics and how to resolve conflict, communication, uh, and many, many others. I highly, highly recommend a program like this or something similar if you can find it. Uh, if you are going into a management position, uh, either you are in one or thinking about being in one, this, this kind of program made such a huge difference to me and was such an eye-opening experience for me. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough, that my attitude towards leadership skills and, and management has, you know, I feel like for the first time in my career, I'm, I'm now equipped to be a better leader and a better manager. But this is not about management, all right? So one of the, one of the skills that we... Um, went through was on negotiation. To give you an example, in one of these sessions we taught, we learned about negotiation, we broke into several pairs of teams and using um, some documentation in the form of like a legal case document, we were given different sides of a story and we were tasked with basically sparring with another team to negotiate for a particular deal. Each round of this role playing taught us specific skills and tactics for negotiation. And we learned things like the importance of doing research and so that you not only have as much information about what you're negotiating about, but who you're negotiating with. Uh, things like BATNA, which is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. This is like your bottom line. If you can't get a deal that's better than your BATNA, then you know it's time to walk away and to feel good about walking away from a deal that's not in your favor. And then there's this idea of anchoring in negotiation, where if you can be the first person to throw out a, a suggested solution, that you the, the conversation from that point forward is anchored around that deal. So that initial offering, if you can do that, then that puts you in a much stronger position to negotiate. At the end of the day, our instructor um, warned us that the skills that we had learned were extremely powerful and that we should use our new powers for good and not for evil. <laughs> well, let's see what we can do with this. About a month later, I found myself in the market for a new vehicle. And I did my research. I knew what I wanted. I knew all the options that were available, and I knew what to expect from my adversary. And I knew that I could walk away from a deal that wasn't better than my BATNA, my best alternative to a negotiated agreement. An opportunity presented itself the day that I went to 
get a cavity filled. And a used truck showed up on a car lot that, at a dealership that was not far from my dentist. And I thought, well, after I get the cavity filled, I'll go uh, check out this truck. And it didn't take long for one of their sharks to, to come after me. I think I, as soon as I stepped foot on the parking lot, he was right on top of me. And he says, what brings you in today? Because that's how we talk <laughs> in, in Georgia, where I'm from. And, he's, and I said, well, I just finished with a dentist appointment, and I was interested in one of your used trucks here. And he said, buddy, research shows that the two things people hate doing the most are going to the dentist and shopping for a car. You're doing both in the same day. You must be tough. Indeed, I am. <laughs> When we got to his office, he made the mistake of letting me make the first strike. And I anchored the deal in, uh, with a number that I was confident was near their bottom line based on my research. And I had a whole lot more firepower from my negotiation class at my disposal. And after the dust had settled, I owned the exact truck I wanted. And I knew I could turn around and easily sell that truck for at least $2,000 more than what I just paid. Walking away knowing that you got a good deal, that's an incredible feeling. And negotiation is a leadership skill that can definitely help you in your life as well as your career. Uh, not, and it's not just for the workplace, but it's something that you can use in the workplace to being able to negotiate on behalf of your, your team for like time and resources and um, you know more software, more hardware, whatever the case may be, being able to make a case, being able to do the research and having those strategies can be invaluable for your team as well as being able to negotiate on behalf of your company uh, for things. That's, that's a pretty important and amazing skill to have. One of the books that our leadership group went through was The Ideal Team Player by Patrick Lincioni. In this book, he describes uh, three virtues that every leader or every great employee must possess. This book can not only help you to hire the best employees, but like me, it was a time of, you know, help me to reflect on my, my career and how I lined up with these, these three virtues and what I could do to help improve myself as to become, you know, an ideal team player. Now, the first and firm, most important virtue is humility. And the characteristics of, of healthy humility are not having an inflated ego, no concern for status, uh, caring more about your team than yourself and your personal gains, and eager to share the credit with those that you work with. Humility, however, is a spectrum. And on one end, at one extreme, you have the opposite of humility. You have people that are characterized as arrogant and self-centered, and they're politicians that, are, that cause division and resentment among your team and, and with other teams. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have someone who almost appears to be humble, but can be just as damaging. They discredit their own talents and value to the team, and they won't point out problems when they see them. And I, on in, you know, introspection, decided that, hey, I'm a lot like a person on that end of the spectrum. There's been a lot of times in my career where you know, I haven't spoken up when I needed to because I felt like my opinion didn't matter, right? One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, had this to say about humility. The heart of being humble is unselfish motivation for your team and your customers. When you truly want the best outcome for everyone around you, then you are acting with humility. The second virtue is hungry. Unfortunately, this is not about food. I would pass that with flying colors if that were the case. Now this is about, um, hungry is a virtue that's characterized by passion and taking ownership of work 
Again, there's a spectrum of behavior. There's at one extreme a person's life who is dominated by the work, their work to the detriment of themselves and everyone around them. You may have heard of or worked with people like that. At the other end, we see a person with no motivation and no passion. They're just doing the bare minimum to get by. And that what we want, what we need, is that balance of passion and diligence that is manageable and sustainable. The third virtue is smart. And this is not about intelligence, but about common sense regarding other people. Um, its characteristics include listening, uh, being engaged and asking good questions, being sensitive about how your words and actions affect other people, and having empathy for your coworkers and, and your customers. To sum up, it's, it's basically having respect for other people. Now here's a Venn diagram of those three virtues because it, it's an unwritten rule that every important presentation must include a Venn diagram. And you can't stop me. So humility, passion, and diligence, empathy, um, sensitivity, respect for people, these are all choices that you can strive to make and skills that you can develop. And by doing so, you not only become an in indispensable employee, you become a leader in the eyes of the people that you work with. Did you know that different people have different personalities? Different people have different behaviors, they have ways of seeing the world and how they process information, how they make decisions, and how they respond to conflict that may be completely foreign to you, the way your perspective of the world is. And our industry attracts a lot of people with, let's say, suboptimal people skills, right? We can be productive and get quite far in our careers on just our technical skills alone. And most of us have become quite comfortable um, talking to our computers rather than to the people that are around us. Um, there are many behavioral and personality assessments that are out there that can help you gain insight and into yourself and other people. This, my favorite so far is called DISC, um, the DISC Behavioral Assessment Tool. And DISC stands for these words that I don't remember what they mean, but it is a fantastic tool for being able to uh, see where people fall on the different ends of the spectrums for his personality traits, such as being action-oriented or, or people-focused. Now, no personality assessment is 100% accurate. It's, it's not, you know, real science, maybe. Um, but, ha but something like this can help you to understand how each person prefers to receive information, process, and communicate. It's a fantastic tool that you, to help you understand people that are different from yourself and to give in give you insight into your own uh, personality. For example, some people are really deep thinkers. They don't like surprises and going into a meeting and being, you know, announcing some big change and expecting to get their input uh, right away is not how they like to operate. They need time to process that, process that new information and think deeply about the, you know, what's new and formulate an opinion and give their feedback. And usually their feedback can be really well thought out and really uh, powerful. Now you need, also need people that are active and gung-ho and make quick decisions and so forth, but you also need people who can think deeply about problems and keep your gung-ho folks grounded. So understanding behavior and personalities can go a long way to helping you empathize with your coworkers. It can also help you to influence others because you know how to best to communicate with people of different personalities. And a better understanding of your own behavior can help you formulate your own strategies for uh, just being able to articulate to your own manager, hey, this is the best way to communicate with me. This is the best way I like to receive information or how I like to operate. And that can make a huge difference in that relationship. 
So learning how other people process information and communicate how they respond to conflict, that puts you in an amazing position of influence and leadership. 100% certified Irma Gerd. What's your greatest weakness? Don't you just love it when that question comes up? You could be, you know, in a job interview or in a, an employee review, a performance review, and up pops this question. And you try to come up with something clever like, well, you know, I just, my greatest weakness is I just work too hard. I, I can't help it. I just got to get things done on time. It's a curse, really. Um, now, another powerful tool is called the Strengths Finder, and this book and assessment is the result of uh, years of study and tens of thousands of surveys done by Gallup. Each, each one of you has unique talents and skills, and the Strengths Finder is designed to help you discover your top five gifts and help you to maximize those gifts. According to Tom Rath and the Gallup research, focusing a lot of time and effort on your weaknesses is only leads to mediocrity at best. When you're not able to use your top strengths at work, chances are you're gonna dread going to work. You're going to have more negative interactions with the people that you work with. You're gonna achieve less and you're just going to have fewer creative moments and you're, it's just not going to be a good time. However, when you're able to discover your top five gifts and focus on your strengths, you will have far greater impact. And when you're in an environment where you're empowered to use your top five strengths, you're going to be 100% more likely to be engaged and have cr more creative moments and have um, you know, much more positive interactions with the people on your team, you're going to be excited about the work that you get to do because you're, you're able to, you have passion about those things that, that care the most, you care the most about. Again, this is an incredible tool that can help you and your team uh, to, together to unlock your potential, to know how your strengths complement each other and how each of you can kind of um, organize the tasks and roles and stuff on, on your team to maximize your strengths. Let's talk about multitasking. Our culture seems to be fixated on multitasking. We put it on our job descriptions, must be a good multitasker. We put it on our resumes, best multitasker ever. And the truth is, none of us are as good at multitasking no matter how, we, how, how hard we try to convince ourselves. Our industry talks about 100% uh, utilization, especially in you know, professional services engagements. Every employee needs to be 100% utilized. We can't be wasting time. So let me ask you, what's a highway at 100% utilization? It's a traffic jam, it's a parking lot. And it's not just my opinion, it's math. It's true for traffic, it's true for fluid dynamics, for electricity, and it's true for people. Now kids love going to a circus. You know, who, who doesn't like going to seeing the, the clowns and so, well, maybe not the clowns. Um, it's exciting to see that lion tamer get into the cage with the lion and not get mauled to death, right? He's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. The whip is cool, but what, what's up with the chair, right? Well, it turns out the whip does nothing for the lion. The whip is for the audience. The chair, however, is what actually keeps the lion at bay. See, lions have an incredible, they have incredible powers of focus. That's what helps them in the wild as predators. When you put the four legs of a chair in a lion's face, the lion can't decide which of those four legs it needs to worry about. And so, in essence, the lion becomes paralyzed with indecision. 
And we are much the same way. When we have too many tasks on our plate, we become rather paralyzed with all trying to, trying to do the mental switching of, of tasks. We think we can switch from tasks to task, but our brains don't work that way. They don't stop thinking about those other problems. And those tasks haunt us in our sleep. How many times have you woke up and said, aha, I have an idea to solve that problem. It's because our brains don't stop thinking about those things. So no matter how hard we try it, to juggle lots of different things, it just doesn't work that way. It may sound counterintuitive, but being able to focus on one thing at a time allows us to more efficiently work through problems and we can get more work done faster by focusing on one thing at a time. There are three inevitable things in life. There's death, taxes, and PowerPoint. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Whether it's speaking for your team, speaking at a company meeting, or even uh, at a meetup or a conference like this, or you know, there's going to be an opportunity sooner or later where you're going to have to stand up in front of a bunch of people, some you may know, some you may, may not know, and give a, a presentation on some information. In 2011, I got up the courage to give my first talk at a user group, and I stank. I was terrible. And, uh, but a funny thing happened. Um, I had people come up to me and thank me for the presentation that I gave and for the, the information that I shared. I had people tell me that I did a great job, even though I knew for certain that I was the worst speaker in speaker history. It took a while for it to sink in, but I learned a valuable lesson about the power of community. There are people out there who are really awesome at being human who will look past your mistakes. They will see the good and potential that is in you, and they will encourage you to not give up. Because when we do hard things, like share our experiences, we all benefit. Now, I hope every day I'm a little more like one of those kind of people. And here's one of my favorite quotes. When I gave my first talk, people didn't remember how I fumbled around with some demo failure. They remember me, and they remember that in some small way, I helped improve their life. In 2016, I had the privilege of giving a keynote at a conference in Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I used to live. And I shared the same story about how I got started. And I had more than one person come up to me after the conference and they said, hey, I remember that. I was there when you gave your first talk. And you're right, you were terrible. <laughs> Sweet. Now, you might be thinking, you know, what I thought is I can understand being voluntold to speak or forced to speak, but why would I... Why would I voluntarily get up in front of an audience of strangers and do this thing that, that is so terrifying? Well, let me tell you, having someone not only understand your message, but then be inspired to actually go and do that thing that you're talking about, that is one of the most rare and precious rewards I have experienced. And there's, number, and there's, a, there's a, a ton of other benefits as well, but that... That right there is, makes it worth it, to know that someone got some value out of something that you, your experience and something that you shared. And they went on to do something more amazing than you ever imagined uh, would come of it. Public speaking is an amazing skill that you can learn that will set you apart and open doors and opportunities and launch you ahead as a leader, an influencer, 
in your company and in your community. I highly encourage you to give it a shot. You heard of the Dilbert Principle? The most ineffective workers are systematically moved to the place where they can do the least amount of damage in management. Early in my career, I worked under a manager who exemplified this Dilbert Principle. I really didn't like the man uh, personally or professionally, and his incompetence was legendary. He was notoriously bad. He, mistakes were named after him, and yet he still continued to rise in rank and responsibilities. And a lot of the work I was required to do under his direction was of no value to anyone. Case in point, I was asked to create a huge binder of documentation for every function, every store procedure uh, that was in the code that I was writing. No one was going to read this, ever. Meaningless and pointless work is soul crushing. I toughed it out for more than a year. I tried to find every which way I could to get out from under his direction, um, but with no hope of relief in sight, I found another job. And I said to myself, life is too short to work somewhere that stinks. And I started living by this philosophy. I started offering it as advice to other people that described their stinky situations that they were in. And in technology, we have this amazing privilege of being able to be in, that we're in such high demand that we can go and work for someplace, you know, somewhere else without a whole lot of, you know, it's pretty easy to do that. Not every, not every pr profession has that luxury. The problem is this idea began to pollute my perspective. And when things started to go sour at a job, I would think, oh, great, here we go again. Time to find another job. And years later, I was in a similar situation. I was unhappy. I started interviewing at other uh, places, and I had a couple of, you know, I had a really attractive job offer on the table. And that, and I was trying to decide if I should go ahead and accept it. And so I went to my wife, and she asked me two questions that stopped me in my tracks. She says, have you done everything that you can do? And if you left now, would you have any regrets? <sighs> I declined the job offer. I took ownership of the situation and I committed to doing everything that I possibly could to make my team successful. In the end, I left that job one year later, almost to the day of that decision, but I left having no regrets and being extremely proud of the work that we had accomplished in that year. Uh, it had been one of the most prolific years of my career. And sure, there can be toxic environments and career limiting situations. There can be incredible opportunities that come along that justify changing a job. But for everything else, I've got a new mindset. Life is too short to let things stay the way they are. And we've all heard the phrase, well, that's not my job, or that's, a, that's not in my job description. And I've learned that taking ownership and responsibility is always the right thing to do. Um, and it has far reaching effects. When other people see you taking ownership for a situation that may not be your, your specific job, then that, you become a leader in their eyes. And it's okay to go to your management and say, look, what can I do to help? How can I help fix this situation? And it's always the right time to do the right thing. Every now and again, we have someone in our, in our team, right, or our, our company that we have to say goodbye to. Sometimes those are really, really awesome people. 
And regardless of the circumstances, we let them know how much we're going to miss them. And we sometimes throw a party and tell stories about awesome things that they'll be remembered for. And like, hey, remember that time when we were at lunch and Julie made you laugh so hard that milk shot out of your nose? We're really going to miss you shooting things out of your nose, right? That was awesome. I'm going to, you know, one day it struck me when we had someone really awesome leave the company that I was at. Why can't we express the, these kinds of things all the time? Why, why do we have to wait until a person is leaving to let them know how awesome they are? Maybe if we had told them what an impact they were having on the team and everyone else around them, that they wouldn't be leaving. So I ran an experiment. Every Friday, I would write a short tribute to someone at work describing what kind of impact they had had on me or my team or the people around them. An example is uh, Nikoda was a, uh, our customer support manager. And as someone described, he did the work of 10,000 people. Nakoda consistently went above and beyond to make our customers happy. And he was awesome. Now, the drawing isn't important. It's just something fun that I like to do. And what I said about each person usually wasn't all that earth-shattering either. Um, the real magic, however, and to get this, the real magic was in what everyone else said throughout the day. Story after story, encouragement, high fives. It was absolutely beautiful. All I did was start the conversation. This experiment lasted for about a year and I had so many people come up to me and thank me for being, uh, for how special it was to be honored and recognized by their peers um, in that way. You see, every one of us wants to know that the things we do matter, that our work has value, that we, as a person, have value. And encouragement highlights that person's strengths. So what does that person now want to do? They, that's positive reinforcement. They, they want to go do that stuff even more awesome than before because it's, you know, it's what got them recognized. They want to keep doing more of it. Now, if you know me, you know I can't go very long without talking about bacon. So I submit to you the highest award for excellence that I can think of. Um, when you encourage someone or a team of people, they will continue to improve and create amazing results. And it becomes a snowball effect. They go on to inspire other people to do more awesome work. And those people go to inspire even more. But maybe you're like me. I grew up in a dysfunctional family where there wasn't a whole lot of encouragement shared. And I didn't know how to encourage people. It was a foreign thing to me. So this is a, yet another skill that I've had to learn. And it's something that you can learn too. So I'll show you, I'll demonstrate. Imagine you have a coworker named Mary. Mary, I want you to know that the database work that you do for our team is invaluable. You do such an incredible job working with all that data. Not only that, but you're always smiling and being cheerful. Um, you are such an encouragement to me and to everyone on the team. Thank you. Paul, thank you for being willing to help. I know I can always count on you when I have a problem to, to talk through it and you help me to come up with new solutions when I'm stuck. Uh, it means a lot to me. Thank you for being awesome. Mark, thank you for always wearing deodorant uh, and coming to work fully dressed. Keep up the good work. See, it's not that hard. You can. You can encourage someone in some way. So don't wait. If there's someone that you know, either that has impacted you in some way, either recently or in the past, 
Let them know about it. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't you wish sometimes you could just fast forward to the future, to the day when you've got it all together and um, have it all mastered and so forth? The reality is there's just no shortcut to success. We get out of life in proportion to what we put into it. And I'm telling you all these things about leadership and not so that you can go back and point fingers at at your leadership and your company and say, well, you know, you're doing it wrong. Or, man, if I was leader around here, things would be different. Um, I'm telling you these things so that you can take a, a look at yourself. Um, so you can take an honest look and say, what, what are some things I could change um, about my, my perspective on life and my perspective on work and, and so forth so that I can become a more valuable employee, so that I can become the most valuable employee that my company has ever seen or to encourage my team to become the most valuable team that my company has ever had. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, and do more, and become more, you are a leader. So said President Mutton Chops in the U.S. None of those things require a fancy title. None of those things require you to be in a management position. You can have an impact on the people around you. And I have one more story to share with you. Thanksgiving 1982. Thanksgiving is a you know, holiday that we, we have in the, in the U.S. where we express thanks for the year and our, uh, what we've been blessed with. And in my family, it was tradition for us to get in the car uh, and my mom would drive me and my brothers and sister to um, another town a couple hours away where my aunt and uncle lived. And it was kind of like a family reunion. All the families would get together on my mom's side and we would celebrate Thanksgiving together. And we had a great time. You know, it was always really awesome getting to see my cousins and aunts and uncles and so forth and, and to experience a lifestyle of of love and encouragement from that I, you know, otherwise didn't, didn't see a lot. This particular fateful Thanksgiving, I discovered this, a TRS-80. And, you know, my cousin had one of these. And I don't know if I spent the entire day, you know, sitting at this keyboard and, and playing around and seeing what was, was on here. But apparently, I made a big impression on my uncle. And sometime after Thanksgiving, my aunt called and invited us back to their house. So we got in the car and we drove two hours away. And there waiting for me was a cardboard box. And inside was the TRS-80, a cassette drive, a floppy disk drive, a number of cables, ribbon cables, a dot matrix printer, and this book. This one kind and very generous act launched me on a journey of love for computers and programming and technology. I continue to be inspired by my aunt and uncle's example of not investing not only in their own family, but in countless lives of, of other people. I can't thank them enough for the impact that they made on my life and my career. You have an amazing opportunity to impact your family in your community, your workplace. You never know if some act of kindness, a word of encouragement, 
or a small investment of your time might be that catalyst that launches another person on their lifelong journey, their livelihood, their passion. The joy, the joy of exploration. So this is my challenge to you, that regardless of the technology that you know, regardless of your age, your years of experience, your title, you have an amazing potential to impact your workplace, your family and community in significant, positive and meaningful ways. So go maximize your gifts and your talents. Go take ownership and responsibility. Go be courageous. Go inspire others. Go and be awesome. Thank you.